Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Many times people ask me, why is it that you speak of the kingdom of God so much? And the answer is very simple. When the kingdom of God is established, that solves everything, every problem for one who's in a covenantal relationship with God through Messiah Yeshua. If we have faith in him and have accepted his plan of salvation, when we enter into that kingdom, I'm speaking about ultimately that new Jerusalem, the final state of the kingdom of God, there will be no longer problems, no more death, no more sickness, nothing against God's perfect desire for us that we might receive his goodness, his love, and his eternal blessings. So we need to be committed to the kingdom of God. And let me say that another way. We need to be people that think according to the kingdom of God. Because when we think according to the kingdom of God, we are going to be led by the Spirit. We are going to make kingdom-based decisions, and those type of decisions are very pleasing to God. We are in a midst of a study from Matthew chapter 17, and we've seen something. Messiah's disciples, now obviously, he's taught them well. Everything that they need to do his will, he has provided. He has spent time with them, teaching them, instructing them, showing them. But here's the problem. The last thing that we talked about in the 17th chapter is that the disciples, they are of little faith. That's how one manuscript translates it. And the other one says that they are against faith. And what does that mean to be against faith? Simply, they are not kingdom-minded. They are not operating in the truth of God. And that leads us to a very important question, and that's this. Are you operating in God's kingdom truth? Do you have that right vantage point, seeing things as God would have you to see them? It's only when we see things from a kingdom perspective, that is the perspective of God, are we going to make correct decisions and that we will be equipped for victory. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to Matthew's Gospel and chapter 17. Now, you'll recall that there was a father and he brought his son to formerly the disciples, and they were not able to help this young man. And we know what the problem was with the young man. He was demon-possessed. Remember, frequently his father said that that demon would, would cause him to fall into fire or fall into water. And these two elements relate to the judgment of God. That's what demonic influence wants to bring about, leads you into God's judgment. But the leadership of the Holy Spirit, the message of the Word of God, that wants to lead you into victory, that you would become an overcomer. So look with me to this 17th chapter, and remember the disciples came and they were, were confused, and they asked him, why were we not able to cast this demon out? And in a few minutes, he'll say. But initially, notice what he says. He scolds them for their faithlessness, their little faith that they were not working, acting, behaving in accordance with the truth of God because, biblically speaking, there is a relationship between truth 
and faith. True faith is when we submit to the truth of God. And I want us to pick up in the middle of verse 20 where it says here, Yeshua is speaking and he says, For truly I say to you, if you have faith as, and we're all familiar with this saying, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Now, we all know that the mustard seed is a tiny seed. But nevertheless, even a tiny bit of truth, when it's applied to our life, when it leads us in those right decisions, there's going to be a powerful outcome. A little faith will bring about a powerful change in your life, in your circumstances, your situation, and also cause you to be an instrument to bring about change in the life of others. So he says to the disciples, you, you are against faith. You have little faith. You're not operating in the truth. But if you were to have faith, as a mustard seed, you would say to, and pay very close attention, you would say to this mountain. Now, when we look at it in the Greek text, it's very important that we see that in the original language, this mountain is not just any mountain, but it is a specific mountain. And what mountain is it? Well, if we look at other gospels that is other scripture in the new testament we find that this mountain that he's referring to is the mount of olives why is that and the answer is prophetic truth do you realize and let me give you the citation in the book of zechariah and zechariah says much about the kingdom of God, much about the last days, what will happen so that we can be faithful people, moving, behaving according to prophetic revelation. And he says that there's coming a day when Messiah returns, where he's coming to ultimately, the scripture tells us, Zechariah tells us, and also the book of Acts, when Messiah returns, and we're not speaking about the blessed hope, not speaking about the rapture, in other words, we're speaking about the second coming. When Messiah returns to earth and he will come and ultimately after he has defeated the enemies, we know where he's going. He is going to, as the disciples were told nearly 2,000 years ago, they were told that in the same way that he ascended into the heavens from the Mount of Olives, that he is going to return in that same manner. In initially that same place, the Mount of Olives. And if you keep reading in Zechariah, and I'm speaking about Zechariah chapter 14, and there it tells us that something's going to happen. Don't want to go off on too much of a prophetic tangent, but it tells us that every nation in the world, did you hear that? Every nation in the world is going to turn against Israel and go up to make war. And when the scripture says all the nations, it means just that, no exceptions. And it's in that final battle that Messiah is going to return. And one of the things that's going to happen, according to Zechariah chapter 14, is this. Messiah, when he lands on that Mount of Olives, that mountain is going to be moved. And this is critical that you hear this. This mountain is going to be moved. Part of it will go to the Mediterranean Sea and part of it towards the Dead Sea. Yam HaMelech, the Salt Sea. And what's going to happen when that mountain is moved? Well, we're not talking so much about prophecy in this lesson, but it is what must happen for the kingdom of God to be established. If you keep reading in Zechariah 14, shortly thereafter, this mountain is moved, the Mount of Olives. We know something. The kingdom is established and good times begin. Godly times begin. 
And this is what Messiah is saying to them. When they come to him and saying, why is it that we were not able to, to cast out this demon? He says two things. First of all, he says, you are against the truth. What truth? The context is kingdom truth. They're not thinking as they ought to think. They're not kingdom-minded, and therefore, what happens? They failed. They could not accomplish what God would have them to do. And therefore, keep reading in this passage. He says, truly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, be moved from here to there. And it will move. And notice the next part. And nothing, and this is emphatic, and nothing will be impossible for you. That is, nothing will be, you will be unable unto you. You will be able to do all things. Now, when he says all things, realize what he's talking about. All things relating to the kingdom. All things relating to the will of God. We would never want to accomplish something that is not rooted in the will of God. So he's not giving here a blank check, whatever you desire. We need to remember, a wise one desires the will of God. One who has a heart that's not defiled, but a heart that's established. A heart that is true to the character of God, the desires of God, the will of God. That heart is going to be one that agrees with God. And let me share with you, if you get nothing else from this time of study, here's what I want you to write down and remember. Every morning when you get up, every evening when you go to bed, write down, God, and this is a prayer, I want to agree with you. Help me to agree with you. And if you diligently and sincerely offer up this prayer, I want to agree with you and what you reveal to me, this I will do. Your life will most certainly be transformed. So ask yourself, can you pray that prayer sincerely? Well, notice what else takes place in this passage. Now we're ready for verse 21. He's talking, he says, but this type, and he's going back to the demon. He says, but this type, and the implication is this type of demon does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And biblically, these two things always go together. When we speak of fasting, it is always, always accompanied with prayer. Fasting is a, a action that empowers. Fasting makes our prayers more effective. It breaks down the things we tend to rely upon, our strength, our perspective, what we want. When we fast, it weakens the flesh, and that empowers the work of the Spirit in us. And let me just simply say, and I know, and I want to say that again, I know this to be the case. When you are kingdom-minded, you are going to be fasting more and praying more. Let's move on to the next statement he makes in verse 22. He says here, but, and this means that there's a disconnect. We, we see something new, but, but still related for us. He says, but as they were returning into the Galilee. Now, I would underline that. This scripture is highly, highly informative because this means they were not in the Galilee. And where were they? Well, the answer is they were near the Mount of olives that is the contextual clue here when it says look again at verse 22 but when returning when they return into the galilee he said this is yeshua jesus he said to them the son of man that is his favorite way of speaking about himself 
as a servant of humanity. He says the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. Likewise, he goes on, and they will kill him. But notice the next thing, and. Now, we would think that the death and the resurrection, unrelated in the sense, one speaks of death and the other one speaks of life. But in the original language, there is a tying together between death and resurrection. It is because we die physically that we are going to experience that new life. So it goes back to what we studied earlier about taking up our cross and we find life. And the problem is here, and many people, and I get so many emails during the Passover time about this, because some scriptures say, after three days and three nights, Messiah will rise from the dead. Others say on the third day. Realize something. The third day is a very important term, biblically speaking. That, that phrase, the third day, carries with it a very important message. Three has to do with revealing, and in this context, three has to do with the will of God manifesting God's will, and three is a victorious day. Now, why do I say that? Well, one of the first places that this appears in the Scripture is in Akidat Yitzchak, that is the binding of Isaac. When Abraham went to Mount Moriah, you know the term Moriah in Hebrew is Moriah, which means the Lord is my teacher. When Abraham went there, all of the fulfillment of this great significant event took place, just read Genesis 22, took place on the third day. So the third day is a day of accomplishment. And when God accomplishes something, there is victory for those who belong to him, who are part of his work, who are committed to his purposes that are serving him. So when we look at this, it really doesn't say on the third day. When we get to Matthew 26 and verse 17, we'll talk more about the grammatical construction. But it literally says here that Messiah it says that they are going to, to put him to death and for the sake of the third day. Now, that term third day has to do with the fulfillment of, of God's will in a victorious manner. So his death is for the purpose of fulfilling the will of God that is going to bring about victory for us. So literally it says because it's in the Greek dative. Now, you may not know Greek uh, grammar and the significance of the different cases, but the, the case, the dative case in this context speaks about for the sake of for a purpose, in order to accomplish something. And the third day is a day of victory, biblically speaking. So Messiah is going to die, and for the sake of the third day, he will be risen, he will raise, and notice something that's not real, real understandable. Because yes, he says, they will put me to death, but then he speaks about his resurrection. Now, resurrection should be something that excites us because resurrection is related to the kingdom. I've mentioned so many times when we see the term or a reference that relates to resurrection, the kingdom should come into our mind. So when he speaks resurrection, they should be happy, excited. But what does the scripture say? Look at the end of verse 23. And they were exceedingly sad. They never get the resurrection. And let me just uh, prove that to you. On that day, the day that they should have been expecting him to fulfill what he said, that is, the day that he said he was going to rise from the dead, no one, no one went to the tomb expecting to see a risen Savior. Those women went there to, to give him a proper burial to anoint what they thought was his dead body. Even Mary Magdalene thought he was dead. No one expected the resurrection. 
And that means what that tells us, no one really had faith in the kingdom of God. They might have loved Yeshua. They might have believed in, in Jesus, but they really didn't have a faith and their life didn't reflect a kingdom hope. And when you don't have a kingdom hope, nothing are you going to do that has an eternal consequence that is ultimately in accordance with the will of God. Look now to verse 24. But after they return into Capernaum, we see that, that the ones receiving, that is collecting, receiving the, the temple tax, they, they came to Peter and said, and they make an accusation, a negative accusation against Messiah. They say, uh, your teacher does not pay the, the temple tax. Now, that was their, their thought. But notice how Peter responded. He says, in essence, in a very strong way, uses the word nigh, which is certainly in the fact that, yes, certainly he does. And when, so that ended that conversation between Peter, yes, he says to them, he pays the tax. And when this one, Peter, entered into the house, this would be the house of Yeshua, we see that Yeshua, he anticipated this issue. Why? He's the son of God. He knows everything. So he, in advance of what Peter was going to speak about, Yeshua, Yeshua anticipating him, what he would ask, Yeshua was saying, what do you think, Simon? There's a question here. He wants Peter to, to think about this in order to arrive at the truth. He says, what do you think, Simon? The kings of the, the earth, from whom do they receive custom and tribute? That is two different types of taxes. So he says to Simon, that is Shimon, Simon Peter, Kepha. He says to Shimon, I have a question. The kings of the earth, who do they get tribute taxes, customs from. And notice what, what Peter said in response. Messiah is still asking, he says, do they receive it? Do they receive it from their sons or from strangers, meaning those who are not in the family? Verse 26, and Peter says to him, from strangers. And of course, he's right. And notice what Yeshua is saying. He is saying here that, that the worship of the children of God is on a different level. We have graduated to become sons and daughters of the living God. And we have a new relationship, that redemptive relationship. And realize something, there is not going to be any temple in the new Jerusalem. Did you know that? And when it says the tabernacle of God dwells with men, this tabernacle is simply God's dwelling place, meaning this, God's dwelling place is going to be among us, with us in that new Jerusalem. We're his family. He wants to be with us. So once again, he says, to whom, from whom do they receive the, the taxes? And he says, of course, from the strangers. Now look at verse, verse 20, 27. Yeshua says to Peter, from, from the, the strangers, therefore, he says, then the sons are free. Free. Meaning God, God in a kingdom situation among his family. The father's not looking to receive he bestows. So he says, therefore, the sons are free, but in order not to offend them. Now, that's such an important principle, and that's this, that we don't want to lay a stumbling block before someone, someone who may not understand, someone who may not have the same commitment, hasn't grown and mature. 
So Yeshua says this, but in order not to offend them, go to the sea, see water. And water biblically is related to blessing. He says, go to the sea, cast a hook. That means go fishing. It's a, an idiom. Cast a hook. And the first fish that comes up, take, open up its mouth. Now, I love this. Here he's telling a fisherman, Peter. See, what Yeshua wants to do is to grow Peter's faith. And if Peter will obey, take Yeshua's instruction and put it into action, he's going to see how great of, of, of master he has. The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the very Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. He knows all things. He says, you cast that hook and the very first fish that comes up, you take and open up its mouth and you will find nothing uncertain you will find a coin and this coin the temple tax was a half shekel now this is using a, a greek coin that had the value of 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 two times the temple tax so we're speaking about enough for two people and that's why yeshua says open up its mouth the mouth of the fish and you will find a coin. Receive that one and give it to them in behalf of me and you. Now, what we see is this, Messiah. Why was this so important? Because he never, ever, ever transgressed any of the law of Moses. He wasn't obligated, but he subjected himself in order to be a witness to those who, who came from that perspective, that they might not have any grounds to make a false accusation. And just think of this. He knew what, what fish Peter would catch first, and he knew what coin would be in there. How? Only God could do this. And that's why over and over the scripture tells us who Yeshua is. He is literally the Son of God. And it's only when you receive Him for truly who He is, the Son of God, are you going to see change, a kingdom change in your life. I'll close with that. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.